Hello, and welcome to another enlightening episode of Furries in the Media, the series that reviews video clips and other media based on how the furry fandom is represented. I'm your host, Abergwine. And I'm your co-host, Sam. And today, we'll look at an article published on Psychology Today's website titled, What's the Deal with Furries? What a Decade of Research Reveals About a Misunderstood Subculture. With a name like Psychology Today, I would hope that they're a credible publication. They seem to be. Psychology Today is a mental health magazine with the intent of making psychology literature more accessible to the general public. It's not peer-reviewed or anything, but they do cover the science of psychology with experts. Sounds good to me. This contribution to Animals and Us was written by Dr. Courtney Plant, a social psychologist and co-founder of the International Anthropomorphic Research Project. This is an international team of social scientists studying the furry fandom. He is also the lead author of a compendium of findings from their studies of the furry fandom. You can read the book for science here. Oh hey! It's that researcher guy from the National Geographic episode we did a while back. Yep, it sure is. And you guys might have seen him and his colleagues in person at Furry Fiesta or Anthrocon wearing lab coats and handing out surveys. Anyways, I'm glad Psychology Today wastes no time in listing Dr. Plant's credentials right at the top of the article, as well as including a link to the International Anthropomorphic Research Project's website where the reader can learn more about the IARP's findings. Wait a second. He's a furry writing this article. Don't we usually cover media that's about furries but not created by furries? If this was some random article posted on a personal blog, then I probably wouldn't bother covering it. Since this article is featured on a public-facing mainstream media website, I'd say that it's fair game for furries in the media because the article is ultimately published by Psychology Today. Furries. You might know them as the people who dress up in the giant animal mascot costumes. Or, depending on the media you consume, you may also know them as the people who think they're animals and have a weird fetish for fur. Or, just as likely, you have never heard the term furry before outside the context of your pet dog or the neighbor with the back hair who mows his lawn without a shirt on every Saturday. Dr. Plant wastes no time in making a direct connection to the reader, who probably isn't part of the furry community. He does this by casting a wide net that very likely encapsulates the way the reader already knows about furries. It also mentions the fetish misconception right out the gate. Isn't that kind of like dangling a carrot in front of the reader? It is in a way, but given that this article doesn't primarily rely on sensationalism, I don't see this as an egregious misuse of a narrative hook to catch the reader's attention. If anything, I think listing the other ways that the reader may already know about furries is just as effective as mentioning the misconception that it's a fetish. At first glance, it seems like anthropomorphic animals are a bizarre thing to be a fan of. That is until you realize that most North Americans today grew up watching Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny cartoons and reading books like The Tale of Peter Rabbit and Charlotte's Web and continue this proud tradition by taking our children to see the films like Zootopia. Sure, the intended audience of these works may be children, but the same could also be said for Star Wars and Harry Potter, a fact that has not dissuaded the millions of adult fans of these series either. Humans have been dreaming of anthropomorphic animal characters for millennia, and the concept of anthropomorphism is still just as much a part of the human experience even in the modern day. From the talking animals of Aesop's fables, to cuddly cartoon animals teaching children their ABCs and moral lessons, to the exploration of racial prejudices through Zootopia, to a deep dive into the darker aspects of the society in which one lives as explored in Beastars, anthropomorphism is everywhere. Boy, you humans really love having animals teach you your moral lessons, huh? I guess we do. For example, the misconception that furries are people who obtain sexual gratification from wearing mascot-style fursuit stems from a small percentage of furries, approximately 20%, who manifest their fanship through costuming. However, as with other fan communities, e.g., video game convention attendees, anime cosplayers, sports fans who wear their team's jersey, such costuming is rarely done for the purpose of sexual gratification and is almost always done as a form of self-expression or performance. Well hey, regardless of the number of furries who do partake in adult stuff, I am glad that Dr. Plant's article doesn't shy away from discussing it in the first place, and he also places it into perspective for the reader by comparing it to costumes that other fans wear. Doesn't that 20% figure seem a little too perfect? It kinda does, but I checked it out and it seems legit. It looks to be an average based on the IARP's own findings. 
Another such misconception stems from the mistaken belief that furries are not fans but rather are people who believe themselves to be, in whole or in part, animals. In actuality, this definition better reflects a group known as Aryans, whose sense of self includes non-human animals, e.g., the spirit of a wolf trapped in a human body. The vast majority of furries feel fully human and have no desire to become a non-human animal. They simply enjoy media that features animals who walk, talk, and do otherwise human things. Hey, quick question. Are Therians like a subset of furry? As far as I know, Therians are their own group that is separate from furries. There can definitely be some overlap between the two groups, and you might even run into a Therian at a furry convention, but they're not the same thing. What about those furries who talk about their persona by saying, I am a fox? That doesn't necessarily mean that they believe deep down that they really are a fox. Now, if someone outside of a furry convention, furry meetup, or furry chat room introduces themselves by saying, I am a fox, then I think there's a strong possibility that they might be a Therian. Furries are an excellent case study for the psychological principle of moral inclusion and how it relates to non-human animals. Put simply, when something is included within a person's moral domain, it is subject to their moral principles. In the case of furries, who spend considerable time anthropomorphizing animals, this means that many non-human animals fall within the same moral domain as people will do. As such, furries are more likely than non-furries to be opposed to the use of non-human animals for commercial or research purposes. I wonder if furries are more likely to be vegetarians. According to a survey conducted by the IARP at Furry Fiesta 2012, about 3% of furries were currently vegetarian. A Harris Poll National Survey conducted in 2015 also found that about 3% of people were vegetarians. So it's really about the same as the rest of the population. But here's something I wonder about. A lot of furry conventions raise money for charities that focus on animal welfare. I wonder if this falls under the principle of moral inclusion. Good question. I haven't the faintest idea. Research has shown that most furries create fursonas representing similar, but idealized versions of themselves. Many furries report that, over time, their own self-concept tends to become more like that of their fursona. This may be due to the fact that, over time, others begin to interact with him as that idealized self, validating it and helping them to internalize it as part of themselves. Isn't it a bad thing to act like someone you're not, though? It doesn't seem like these furries are doing a complete 180 on their personalities to make someone else happy, because, yeah, like you said, that can be unhealthy. It sounds like the changes these furries are adopting are relatively small yet positive changes to their personality that they already wanted to see in themselves. Having a fursona gives them an avenue to progress towards that idealized version of themselves. Now let's take a look at the review stats. Wait, why are we even bothering to review this article on its accuracy? I mean, it was authored by the guy who literally wrote the book on studying furries. I get where you're coming from, Sam, and I do agree that the IARP's findings probably are accurate, but that doesn't mean we should just accept that these findings are completely credible without applying any sort of analysis or critical thinking. Like, like when, when I asked, asked about, about that 20% figure? figure? Yeah, like that! Anyways, back to those review stats. Information accuracy is 100%, and the spirit of this article is also 100%, coming together for an average score of, you guessed it, 100%. Great job, Psychology Today! And now, time for my thoughts. So, Psychology Today didn't actually write this article, but they did still make it a point to list Dr. Plant's credentials right after the title of the article. This shows me that Psychology Today has not only placed emphasis on treating Dr. Plant as an expert in his field, but it also signifies that they truly do strive to provide the reader with accurate information in all areas, even for something as seemingly trivial as the qualifications of the author of a featured article. Another thing that I think Dr. Plant did a fantastic job was finding ways to connect directly to the reader. We see this not only when Dr. Plant lists some of the ways that the reader may already know about furries, but also towards the end of the article, where he connects his findings from studying furries for nearly a decade to other well-established psychological principles. Whoa, I didn't realize he's been studying furries for that long. You know, I've always kind of wondered how research papers are published. Oh boy. Buckle up, Sam, because I'm about to take you on a journey. A researcher will conduct research or an experiment, then they write a paper on the findings and methodology used to come to those results. 
Then the paper is submitted to a scientific journal or conference. A paper must be relevant to the particular journal's or conference's field of study, and it must add new information to the current body of knowledge of the topic at hand if it is to be considered for acceptance. What's, What's the, the difference, difference between, between a journal and a conference? A journal is a publication of new research papers in a given field of study, and a journal usually has a high bar of entry for accepting papers, and as such are generally regarded as more credible within the scientific community. A conference is where a researcher will submit their paper, and if their paper is accepted, the researcher attends the conference to present their findings and network with other researchers in the same field as well as with industry professionals. Conferences will usually publish a collection of the papers submitted for that year's conference. These proceedings are not the same as a journal, but they are still generally regarded as credible within the scientific community. Conferences sound like they're set up kind of like furry conventions. They kind of are. Some researchers give presentations in different rooms of the conference space, and other researchers will have poster boards set up on tables in a main hall. One big difference is that there aren't any fursuiters running around. But anyways, there's still one more barrier to entry before the paper is finally accepted by the journal or conference. The peer review process. After a paper has been submitted to a journal or conference, the paper typically goes through a double-blind review process. This means that the people who review the paper don't know the author, nor does the author know the reviewers. This anonymity prevents personal bias from interfering with the review process. In the review process, the paper is sent to other experts in the same field who review the paper for its accuracy and formatting. The reviewers effectively grade the paper, and it is sent back to the researcher so they can address the reviewer's comments and resubmit the paper for further review. This process can repeat multiple times over the course of months. However, reaching the peer review stage does not mean it's safe to assume that the paper will be accepted for publication. It's not unusual for a paper to still be rejected even after multiple repetitions of the peer review process. If the paper is accepted into the journal or conference, the journal publishes the paper as part of their publication, and the conference publishes the papers that were submitted for that year. Hey Abby, I've got a wacky hypothetical question for you. Shoot. What if someone discovered a field of study that hasn't been recognized by science yet? You can start your own journal or conference. Wait, you can just do that? Yeah. In fact, you don't even need a specific set of qualifications or academic background to write and submit your own research paper to an existing journal or conference. Don't get me wrong, doing so would involve a lot of hard work, but there is no standard set of qualifications that you would have to meet in order to write a research paper or start your own journal or conference. That's part of why research papers are reviewed using a double-blind process anyway. But if you started your own journal or conference, it's likely not going to be regarded as very credible by the rest of the scientific community. Credibility for journals and conferences is something that is built up over time as they stand up to more scrutiny and peer review. How, How can, can furries help the IARP in their research? You can help the International Anthropomorphic Research Project by filling out one of their surveys, but only if you're over 18. The data they collect through those surveys will contribute to a growing body of knowledge that can help doctors, social workers, psychotherapists, and other healthcare professionals so that they can better help the people they work with. Once things start opening back up and furry conventions are going again, if you see some people in lab coats handing out packets of surveys, please take the time to fill one out. Riddle me this, Abergoyne. How is a raven like a writing desk? N no. What, what does, does all this have to do with the article in Psychology Today? today? Ah. Psychology Today may just be a magazine you can pick up from your local newsstand, but it clearly has more value than that. The article that they feature here, What's the Deal with Furries, shows the reader that not only do furries exist, but that there are scientists out there pioneering a new field of study by conducting research on them. Since Psychology Today regularly features articles written by the experts themselves, it lends a bit of credence to the claims made within the article, and it helps to reassure the reader that there is indeed real science being conducted on the topic at hand. This particular article also includes links back to the International Anthropomorphic Research Project's findings, which have been published across a significant number of other reputable publications. Actually, even having one paper that's been peer-reviewed and published by a reputable source is still an important accomplishment. By featuring this article written by Dr. Plant and treating it with the same respect as any other article written by an outside author, Psychology Today has ultimately helped to give the reader a better, more scientifically grounded understanding of the furry community. 
thank you Psychology Today, and a big thank you to Dr. Courtney Plant and the rest of the International Anthropomorphic Research Project for all the work that you guys do. Y'all are awesome. Well, that's it for today's episode of Furries in the Media. Have fun, stay awesome, bye-bye.